what role did music play in your childhood? You know, I was the kind of kid that spent most of his time running around the woods looking for snakes and salamanders and playing soccer. So I got to be honest, music was not my primary thing when I was growing up. Uh, I sang a lot in church. I uh, was raised in the Church of Christ where it's just all a cappella singing, no instruments. So uh, harmony, um, singing is still a big part of what I love to this day. I love three-part harmonies. Four-part is even better. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, I had just a very amateur relationship with music put it that way nobody in my family was a musician I didn't grow up going to a lot of concerts I just I heard it on the radio and I reacted to it with really no preconceived notions and that's really I, I discovered country music um, in high school and had never heard it before and it just spoke to me you know mm -hmm. so I really came to country music um, not from a long line of country people, but, but more uh, just as a, an open-hearted listener of music falling in love with a new genre. Speaking of harmonies, um, it was one of the things that I noticed first off in the very first track of the record to Feeling Free was the, yeah. those harmonies. What mostly struck me from the first sentence was the lack of loudness like not volume but the loudness of the record mm -hmm. um which is now like every record i get sent it's big drums and big everything and big loops and big 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 and everything sounds huge yeah um how much was that on purpose that you wanted that to be and how much was that just dictated by the kind of songs you write i think a little bit of both for sure um i like dynamics you know which is it changes, you know, it starts off, I like things to be able to build and then come back down and, and, um, and I do think that I do that naturally in my songwriting, you know, I kind of, as I'm writing the song, I hear it getting real big in this part and then coming down to just me and the guitar at this part. And, um, so, um, for me, it makes for a more, interesting record, maybe a little bit less boring to have those dynamics in there. What I think has been lost with a lot of those songs that are highly compressed, so that even the quiet parts are loud, Yeah, um, is that art of, and it's not unique to country, but it seems to have perfected it, the art of keeping songs small to make the emotion big. Mm. Is that something that you relate to? Yeah, I agree with you on that. <clears throat> just a simple, powerful song, you know. I think that's, uh, like you said, what country music can can do best, maybe. And my producer gets a lot of credit, too. Tom Faulkner uh, is a believer in music, the music to have breath and space and, and air inside it. Um, he's not a fan of over-compression. We have long conversations about these things. <clears throat> we worry about them a lot when we're making a record. And, you know, for me, it's it's a balancing act of wanting to sound full enough and big enough that it doesn't, that it fits on, on the radio, back to back with all those other, with everything else that's going on in country music. But to where also maybe, um, maybe it catches people's ear because it's a little different. I, I think it, you know, at the end of the day, it all boils down to, to personal taste and and what best fits the song, but um, but yeah, I think you're right on as far as having just a simple a simple production and a simple song can sometimes really hit home the most. You also have an active and interactive live show. How much does that thought? come into play when you're in the studio, that it has to be something that has to be on a stage. Does that come into it at all? Or are, are records records and live is live? Uh, once again, it's a balancing act between those two because I really feel like in the studio, you're free to do whatever you want to do and you ought to take advantage of that freedom. You know, you ought to, at the end of the day, you ought to make the best recorded 
music that you can make. So I don't mind having a xylophone come in for this one part of this one song if that if it makes for a cool moment in the song. At the same time, I'm playing every weekend in a honky tonk, and always in the back of my mind is, well, how are we going to pull this off with my five piece band? You know, and so I definitely. Uh, I, basically, I'm willing to add that other stuff if it really needs it and if it really does something special for the song. If not, I'd rather just keep it, you know, if the song doesn't need that other stuff, I'd rather just keep it simple um, and come up with really great parts for the fiddle and the electric guitar so that we can just reproduce that live and it'll sound exactly the way it does on the record. And, uh, it's special when that happens. I've got a song <clears throat> called A Little Too Late off of Overnight Success that I feel like sounds really good on the record, but when we do it live, you know, it's it sounds just like it does on the record, and people really appreciate that, you know, that it sounds mm -hmm. the same. And if you get too crazy on the record, you do sacrifice that a little bit in the live show. I can't afford a 10-piece band. <laughs> so then with a song like Here's to You, which is that ode to your the people you're speaking to on from the stage, um, in a song like that, where does that what wins out there? Does the experience of them, what you're wanting to have them, does that win, or is it still this is what sounds good on a record? There's a little bit of both. We do have some stuff on that uh particular cut, like we have an accordion on there and we don't have that live. We have electric guitar and mandolin at the same time. And my electric guitarist can play mandolin, but not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so when we do that one, um, we just had to spend a little bit of extra time on our arrangement as a live band, trying to make sure that it sounded full and had the same dynamics. And it's a challenge. It's, it's tricky on that one because we had some of that extra stuff. That was one thing that was fun for me about playing the Opry is they have a house band and it's like 10 pieces, background singers, <laughs> anything you want. So we just sent them the track and said, we want it to sound like this. And I, and I got to use, I got to sort of take advantage of their whole many piece band. And so someday if we get to that level where we can do that every night, um, then that gives, you know, it gives something gives everybody something to do, you know, when you've got all that on the record. Mm -hmm. Your press material had five descriptors at the top of the page. And like I, I told you before we started talking, I, I think they're all very, very important concepts, both in life and in making music and the music industry. What does the word authenticity mean to you? Uh, authenticity, you know, for me, uh, is uh, obviously realness, um, which, what does that exactly mean? I would kind of define it as um, honesty, uh, also sort of a, an integrity between who you are and the music that you make to where they're not two different things. Like to where the, the music that you make is an honest, accurate reflection of who you really are and what you're really experiencing in life. To me, that's authentic. If you're, if you're writing about something in a song just because it makes a good song or you think it's what people want to hear, but it's not really based in reality, then you could, you could have a fun song that way, but I wouldn't call it authentic exactly. Mm -hmm. Why is self-reliance important? Uh, for me as an independent artist, just to get where I am has required a lot of self-reliance. It's, it's kind of an attitude of, I'm going to do this and y'all can either get on board <laughs> or, you know, not. Because... I definitely, especially when I lived here in Nashville, I definitely got a lot of no's, a lot of closed doors, a lot of, um, uh, you know, thank you for your time. Um, and if 
I think if you're too reliant on other people to make things happen for you, you could easily give up when when it doesn't happen. Um, so at the end of the day, when when it was when I was to the point where I was ready to give up on music, um, I was really looking at starting my own business in in some other field. And, and it was then that I sort of realized, well, dude, if you're going to start your own business, what you need to do is do the music business because that's what you know how to do and just be more entrepreneurial about it. Be more, that's, that's really when I decided to just quit waiting around for somebody else to give me a record deal or to say, okay, you're good. We'll, we'll make you successful. Here's a million dollars, you know, to put into your career. You wait, you wait, you wait. That doesn't, it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. And eventually, I, I, I realized um, I just need to treat this like a, an entrepreneurial startup business. I just need to go do this, find a way to make it work, find a way to make money. And when we moved to Texas, it made that a lot easier because uh, they make country music in Nashville, but they sell it in Texas. You know what I mean? That's it's the biggest country market that there is. And I live in. Dallas Fort Worth, which is the single biggest country music market in the world, and therefore the known universe. Uh, <clears throat> but so for me to to be close geographically in proximity to all these country music fans gave me the opportunity to where hey, if you have a good product, you know you ought to be able to make a living. You can sell it to people, and sure enough, it didn't take me too long before I was getting paid enough for my live performances and selling enough CDs and hats and t-shirts and stuff that I was at least making a living, you know? <clears throat> the next phrase that's here is hard work. And I always hear people say, oh, if you work hard, you'll make it and only just work hard and work hard. But you also have to work hard at the right thing. Because if you work hard at the wrong thing, it's not going to happen either. Yeah. Um, and now that you've likened it to any other startup business, which I really, I like that you did that. Um, talk a little about that, those first steps when you started your own business and you were you for a living. Um, yeah. You were selling yourself for a living. Yeah. You were your product. Um, how did that manifest? Yeah, that's really the only difference between the music business and any other business is that what you're selling is your own, your your own name and your own face is the, is the picture of the brand. But at the end of the day, it's just figuring out a way to connect with your market and uh, give people what they want, and then they return that reward with uh, with their money. And like any startup business, it's when I say hard work, owning your own business. I mean, it's twenty four seven. You know, I'm I'm the I'm the boss, and I'm also the janitor. You know, I I. I'm the one that writes the songs. I'm also the one that takes the van for an oil change and fixes the trailer on Tuesday morning and, you know, count folds t-shirts and stuff. I mean, I do all of that stuff. And um, looking back on my years in Nashville, I think I was not focused enough. I was, I was doing a lot of other things besides music. I was doing music, but then on my time off, I was, you know, playing soccer and you know, volunteering for church and doing these good things. But nowadays I do, I just work all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have, I don't have time for hobbies anymore. I don't. Well, you your know, hobby is folding t-shirts. I, I, I know. I don't, I don't really get enough sleep. Of course, part of it's that I have kids now. So if I'm not working, then I'm working at being dad, mm -hmm. changing diapers and, you know, playing uh, wrestling and <clears throat> playing transformers and whatever, you know, so, um, so these days I don't, I don't, I really honestly don't do hobbies. Um, I work all the time, but I enjoy what I do. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. What place in your life does camaraderie have both with respect to the music industry and the camaraderie within that, and then toward your audience? Well, it's always been easier for me to have a sense of camaraderie with the audience than, than with music industry. Um, I, my, my fans, I, I feel more like friends, you know what I mean? 
and I prefer to watch a show from out in the audience as opposed to backstage. You know what I mean? And so, um, the camaraderie that I have with my band and with my fans and everything, it just, that's what makes it so fun, even though it is hard work, even though we don't always get a lot of sleep and even though we don't, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a lot of load in and load out and mundane tasks to, to be done. Um, at the end of the day, I'm working with people that I love. With the, we love the fans. Um, and so the Grand Ole Opry show was the perfect kind of culmination of that camaraderie there because I had my, my family there. Um, I had some friends there. And then I had uh, some fans that were able to f fly in from around the country and, and, uh, and be there. And it, it just ended up being sort of a celebration of not just me and my music, but really our, our whole community. And uh, th there is sort of a community of like-minded folks that get into my music and that show up at a lot of the shows to where you go up and you say, hey, so-and-so, and hey, everybody knows each other, and they all sit, somebody saved you a seat, and the Zaniacs are, they're, uh, they're, they're a cool bunch cool bunch of people so a lot of them flew up from Texas to be at the Grand Ole Opry thing and, and that just kind of goes to show the the camaraderie that exists through music and that's I feel really lucky uh, because when I do my music I think people really get to know me my heart and where, where I'm at and therefore uh, we have that close connection right away even even if someone's just a stranger if they come up and they're like man I love while I was away really speaks to me it's like I feel like I give that person a hug and I feel like we're friends you know like we're we know each other and um, being able to have that kind of a connection with so that kind of a personal connection with so many people who otherwise would just be strangers is something really special that I think only music can make possible and then for the final descriptor that was on here, which is hugely huge in my life, how do you cultivate gratitude? Well, for me, one thing that helped me be more grateful was that I struggled and struggled for 10 years, 15 years, uh, and still struggle and have hard days and bad gigs and everything. So when... Um, when you finally do over time develop that team of people that believe in you and that are invested of their own time and money and effort and, and heart and soul into your career. Um, and then when you finally do get those fans that love your music and are singing along and giving you all that positive energy, for me, the gratitude comes natural because I'm not a 19 year old kid that, you know, just put out his first song and shot to stardom and it's like, yeah, I deserve this because I'm awesome. You know, that's not my attitude. I'm, I'm more like, wow, I've been doing this forever and I'm finally, uh, finally getting to the point where we got some really good shows with a lot of people singing along and I just want to hug every single one of them, you know, for, for being there and for making it so much fun and for allowing me to make enough money where I can at least get down the road and do the next show. <laughs>